Audio lecture for World History Unit 3, The Heirs of Rome, the Byzantine Empire, and Medieval Europe. The Byzantine Empire is also known as the Eastern Roman Empire. It is the half of the Roman Empire that did not fall in 476. In 476, the Western Roman Empire did fall. It collapsed under the pressure of those invasions, but the Eastern Empire lived another thousand years. The Eastern Empire is known as the Byzantine Empire, and its capital will be at Constantinople, which was formerly called Byzantium. As we discussed in a previous unit, it was renamed Constantinople by the Emperor Constantine when he moved the capital of the entire Roman Empire to that eastern city. Constantinople is on the Bosporus Strait and it prospered by controlling trade routes of the eastern Mediterranean. Three continents meet here at the Bosporus Strait and it's marked in red on the map. You see there's Europe, Asia, and Africa all meet in part of this Byzantine Empire. The Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea are also located there. Red Sea. Robert of Clar, who was a French crusader, wrote in 1204, not since the world was made was there ever seen so great a treasure nor do I think myself that in the forty richest cities of the world had there been so much wealth as was found in Constantinople. For the Greeks say that two-thirds of the wealth of this world is in Constantinople, and the other third scattered throughout the world. Constantinople is located on a peninsula. It is an easily defended territory with massive walls that were built to protect the one vulnerable side. You see here where that's the Bosphorus Strait. This is what the city of Constantinople looked like with its walls around it. And there are the real walls and where they were located on the map. About our city you shall know until the end she will fear no nation whatsoever, for no one will entrap or capture her, not be by any means, for she has been given to the mother of God, and no one will snatch her out of her hands. Many nations will break their horns against her walls and withdraw with shame, a 13th century Byzantine historian wrote. The Byzantines maintained the Roman roads since they were officially Romans, the eastern half of the Roman Empire that survived. They also maintained the imperial institutions as well as the autocracy, the idea of a single ruler governing all. The double-headed eagle, as you see here, is the crest of the Byzantine Empire. The emperors combined both secular power known as Caesar, the title Caesar, and the spiritual power of like the Pope in Western Europe. And they call this Caesaropapism. So there was not the division of church and state in the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine emperors controlled Christianity in the empire by defining orthodox or what was known as accepted Christianity and heretical ideas or false and dangerous beliefs. Emperors were also known as to be above the law and they oversaw large complex bureaucracies. The word Byzantine means overly complicated system today because the bureaucracies were so extravagant. The Age of Justinian. Justinian reigned from 
527 to 565. Emperor Justinian was the most important of the early Byzantine emperors. There he is there in the middle. You have the priests on one side, scholars on the other, warriors beside them as well. He built the Hagia Sophia, or the Church of Holy Wisdom, which is the largest church in the world at the time. Here's the interior of the Hagia Sophia. He built it in hopes that it would be beautiful enough for God himself to be pleased. Justinian also attempted to reconquer the lost western provinces, the western half of the Roman Empire that had fallen. Um, and he did succeed in conquering parts of it. He did conquer North Africa and Spain. Justinian ordered the recodification of Roman law, and this is his most important contribution. Codified laws or legal systems, remember we said, provide order for society. So he updated the old laws and he added new ones to it. The four parts of Justinian's coded, codified, codified law ultimately will become the basis for many European legal systems in the future. Justinian's codified law is known as the body of civil law. We sometimes just refer to it now as Justinian's code. And it served as the basis of civil laws in Western society for years to come. The introduction to Justinian's Code is as follows. Since there is nothing as worthy of attention as the authority of the law, which properly regulates all affairs, both divine and human, and expels all injustice, we have found the laws which have come down to us from the foundation of the city of Rome to be so confused that it is extended to an infinite length and it is not within the grasp of human capacity. Our goal is to correct their constitutions and make them more easily understood to the end that being included in a single code. Simplifying the old Roman laws, updating them, getting rid of sections that may contradict each other, all of this was done to make the law more clear. It's still Roman law but it's updated and modernized for a new era. Art also will flourish under Justinian, including mosaics. Mosaics were found mostly in churches, but also some in government buildings. And they were decorative tiles, sometimes glass or jewels pieced together. Icons also were a part of uh, Byzantine art. Uh, religious images being portrayed in art are what icons are. You see here a, a mosaic and you see here an icon. You also see a mosaic of the Empress Theodora. She was the wife of Justinian. Byzantine scholars copied ancient Greek and Roman manuscripts as well, preserving the classical legacy. If they had not done that, many of those uh, works would have been lost to us forever. The Byzantines, like the Chinese, granted merchants no political power. Bureaucrats refused to share power as well. Byzantine women had very little freedom. They wore veils in public and they were mostly confined to their homes. The Schism. The Eastern Orthodox Church that emerged in Byzantium was ultimately separated from the Roman Catholic Church in the West. Now remember, the Roman Catholic Church was the original Christian church. So this is what, why we call it a schism, which means a division between two different branches of the Christian church. Both religions or both branches of 
the Christian Church, competed for converts in Eastern Europe, with the Orthodox Church being the most successful. The Catholic Church, remember, was run by the Pope. He held power over kings, we'll discuss this more in um, later slides, and the Orthodox Church was led by what was called a Patriarch. But the Patriarch was controlled by the Byzantine Emperor. So the Pope in Western Europe is ultimately going to be more powerful than many of the Western kings through the Middle Ages. This will shift after the Middle Ages come to an end. But in the Byzantine Empire, in the Orthodox Church, the Patriarch will always be subject to the Byzantine Emperor because of Cesare Papism. Orthodox churches believed that icons suggested the presence of religious figures. Catholics considered this verging on the worship of false idols. So they did not want people to have icons that they carried with them into the church services. The Catholic Church also was different than the Orthodox Church because it used the Latin language. The Orthodox Church used the Greek language, which of course was the language of the Byzantine Empire. This also created division. In 1054, after years of friction and trying to figure out if they could come up with some kind of compromise, the division of the Orthodox Patriarch and the Catholic Pope happened. Each excommunicated the other, not recognizing their authority. As a matter of fact, each of them considered the others heretics, meaning when they excommunicated them, they basically were saying that they were no longer welcome in the Christian religion. Of course, both can't be correct, but the Orthodox believers believed that the Patriarch was correct and the Catholic believers believed that the Pope was correct. Now, this is not the beginning of the denominations of Christianity that we have today. That's not going to happen until the 1500s with the Protestant Reformation. But we do now have two different brands of Christian church. We have the Orthodox Church in the Byzantine Empire, and we will see it will spread up into Russia as well. And then we also have the Roman Catholic Church in the West and throughout Western Europe. The Great Schism created a division within Christianity that remains today. It even remains worse, however, when it comes to division, if you think that we have many different denominations since the 1500s with the Protestant Reformation. There will never again be unity among all Christians. Instead, there will be a mosaic, if you will, of different Christian denominations. Orthodox Christianity in the world today is shown on this map. The darker the blue, the higher the percentage of Orthodox Christians living in that country. Byzantium and early Russia. North of Byzantium, the Russians or the Slavic people organized a large state. The Russian city of Kiev on the Dnieper River controlled trade between Scandinavia and Byzantium. Through trade and cultural diffusion, the Byzantines profoundly influenced the development of early Russia. That's one of the reasons why the Orthodox Church spreads into Russia. In 989, Vladimir of Kiev converted to Orthodox Christianity and therefore introduced the religion to Russia. We will see a similar event happen in Western Europe when the uh, Germanic barbarian tribes that infiltrated what had been the western half of Rome 
causing it to fall, and then settling in those areas when they convert to Christianity or Roman Catholicism. We will see that they will force their people also to convert, and therefore all of those kingdoms will become Christianized, Catholicized. The Cyrillic alphabet was adopted in Russia. It was invented by the, a Byzantine missionary named Cyril. This will eventually be the alphabet that is used in Russia and is still used today. Byzantine art and architecture, law codes, and the autocratic government were all adopted in Russia. The word Tsar is basically Caesar in the Slavic language. Now we're moving on to medieval Europe. This of course is the portion of history that filled the power vacuum that was left by the western half of the Roman Empire falling. We're going to start with what is commonly known as the Dark Ages. So timeline check between 500 and 1500 Western Europe went through what is known as the Middle Ages or medieval times. So it starts basically with the collapse of Rome and goes basically until the Renaissance era. There's the ancient world, classical world if you will, classical age, and of course the Renaissance era, the common era, modern age. What's in between is what we're covering in this unit, the Middle Ages. The Dark Ages is the first half of the Middle Ages. So the period from 500 to about 1000 is called the Dark Ages in Europe. It's called a Dark Age ultimately because it is the opposite of a Golden Age. Now remember, a Golden Age is a time of peace and prosperity economic activity um, and flourishing allows for a, a cultural flowering and intellectual um, advancements being made. So the Dark Age or the Dark Ages here in Europe is the basically the reverse of that. A period of decline, a period of chaos politically, lots of warfare, and a loss of intellectual activity, a loss of cultural um, flourishing. In 476, if you recall, the Germanic groups, also known as the barbarians by the Romans, ultimately caused the collapse of the western half of the Roman Empire. And they settled in and took over those areas that had once been controlled by the western Roman Empire. The Germanic peoples were illiterate, pastoral, um, tribal individuals. They will settle into the former Western Roman Empire, which is now modern day Western Europe, and ultimately adopt and adapt a lot of the Roman ways to their own. The structure of the Roman Empire had collapsed. Written language was lost. Monumental architecture stopped being built. Organized government was non-existent and trade came to a halt during the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages were therefore chaotic. Lots of conflict among the German groups existed and invasions from outsiders were very common. So warfare is common, um, not the peace and prosperity that we saw during the Golden Age of the Roman Empire. This, of course, will lead to the rise of what we know as feudal Europe. The Dark Ages, as we said, lacked organized government structure. The Germanic groups that settled in these other areas were not united politically. Um, instead, they were uh, tribal individuals 
that were normally local to uh, loyal to a local chief or a lord rather than kings and large states. This is known as decentralized style of government where lords owned the land and the land was the source of power. So this is when we start referring to land equaling power in the Western world. And this decentralized government, even though it's decentralized, it did, it did not lack some kind of structure. It ultimately led to the development of feudalism. Okay, so feudal systems ultimately developed during this dark age period, the early middle ages or medieval period, uh, to create political and social order. They are there to try to fill the power vacuum, the political power vacuum that was left by the fall of the strong centralized government that had existed during the Roman Empire. Again, all of these different groups settle in parts of what had been the Roman Empire. The Visigoths settling in Spain, the Franks settling in Gaul, which will become known as France after the Franks, the Angles and the Saxons moving into England, uh, um, the Vandals moving into Northern um, Africa. All these different groups um, ultimately will establish what will be known as kingdoms. Um, even though they're kingdoms though, the, the king himself does not maintain a kind of centralized governing structure that we saw in an empire. Instead, the uh, power is sort of um, uh, delegated out to uh, other individuals and ultimately um, it creates what is known as the feudal system. Okay, this political and social order develops during these chaotic time periods that we see during the early Middle Ages or the Dark Ages. And if you see here, this is kind of how it works. Even though the king is technically at the top, he really doesn't have a lot of um, control over what's going on. Uh, it's more of a figurehead type of um, um, leadership. Most of the real power is in the hands of the nobles who control the lands, okay? So the nobles eventually are known as the lords, okay? And then of course they have the knights who are their vassals. They are still part of the nobility, but they are lesser nobles underneath them. These knights are their vassals and they are loyal to their nobles. They will fight to protect the land from the constant warfare that's going on. Other groups trying to come in and take land. Um, and so the, the knights are the vassals that are the, the military force. And they get their payment directly from the lords, the nobles. They get that in, um, you know, a, a piece of land from that noble, a fief. Uh, then it, eventually you see that those knights are the ones that are protecting the peasants that are living on those lands. Now the peasants do not own the land. They work the land of the lords that are above them um, in exchange for the protection that, that lord can give them from those outside invaders. You can't depend upon the king for protection because the king does not have enough power and enough clout and enough wealth to protect an entire kingdom himself. He is reliant on those nobles and their vassals, their knights, to protect their little pieces of the entire realm. So ultimately that's why the nobles have the majority of the real power, the lords. Okay, so the peasants, they work the land to provide the food and services for the lords as well as for the Lord's vassals that are still above them, the peasants are the ones that are not of noble status. Okay, so the Lords and the Knights are both noble, just upper nobles and lower nobles. Then, of course, those Knights, of course, as I said before, they provide protection and military service for the Lords, and the Lords provide money and Knights for the King if need be. A clear social hierarchy emerged ultimately among the elite with those lords, the upper nobles, and the vassals who were the lesser nobles beneath them 
that were basically the knights that would fight for them. The lords were the superior and the vassals were the inferior, but they are both members of the noble class. They ultimately in this picture you see here are represented in the middle by the knight, represents the nobility. The other two levels of society in the Dark Ages in the early medieval period are of course on the left the clergy, okay, and then on the right the peasantry. Warriors, as I said, called knights, were bound to lords through oaths of loyalty in exchange for a piece of the lord's land. A fief is what it was called. They also would receive food, shelter, and weapons so they could defend the realm from those outside invasions. So in other words, this feudal system developed out of a need for protection. And because they could not depend upon a centralized king really to provide that protection. The king had to depend upon the, le the, the lords that were beneath him, the upper nobles, to protect little pieces of the bigger kingdom. And therefore, that's why those lords really had the majority of the power. Because they were the ones that controlled the military that would ultimately protect the realm. Okay, so the, like I said, warriors were called knights. They were bound to the lords through oaths of loyalty in exchange for that piece of land, a fief, food, shelter, and weapons. And there you see how many they would have. Knights followed also what was known as the Code of Chivalry. Chivalry was based on their loyalty to their lord. It also was based on honor, honor in battle, and honor in, um, in life, as well as a sense of justice. Peasants, as I said earlier, were bound to the lords for food. Yes, they worked the lands to create the food, but that land belonged to the lord, so the food had to be given to the lord. The lord would then give some of the food back to the peasants, um, as well as providing shelter for them, giving them a little tiny area that they could build a little hut on, um, and protection from those outside invaders with their knights, you know, protecting the, the area in exchange for the labor of the land. So the peasants did not own any land. As a matter of fact, the peasants were kind of part of the feudal manor. Um, as it was called. They, they, they were tied to the land, um, but they didn't own it. That It was owned by the, the greater lords. Manorialism is the economic system that is based on farming that is connected to feudalism. This is the economic system that developed during the medieval times. So the economy of all of Western Europe was tied to farming. We have the decline of trade, big trade centers, cities, etc., towns kind of go by the wayside during the Dark Ages because those towns and cities were the first things that would be sacked by the outside invaders coming in trying to take territory. So uh, people fled away from towns and cities, trade kind of uh, got halted a bit, and instead people went back to the land, living off the land. Um, and that became the basis of the economic systems in early medieval Europe. The land, as I said before, were called manors. Sometimes they were called fiefs. It was called a fief when it was given to a, a vassal um, or a knight, a lesser noble. Uh, and they were owned by the lords. It was farmed, however, by the peasants. Manners were largely self-sufficient due to the lack of trade. They had to be since there was very little trade. They had to produce everything they could possibly need as much as they could. So they produced everything from food to, uh, as you see, wool from the, sh from the sheep that, so they could make clothing out of it, um, to milk, to vegetables, everything. Most peasants were known as serfs, and those serfs, as I said before, were bound to the land. They were not 
slaves, however. They could not be sold to another lord um, or another, uh, you know, no noble. But they were tied to the land, so to speak, bound to serve the lord um, on the land and uh, in exchange for the protection that lord could give them from those outside invaders. Manners divided land into three units as part of what is known as the open field system. One part of the land was reserved for the Lord and two were open for the peasants to live on and to farm. Now remember, this land is still owned by the Lord, so the farming that was being done was for the Lord. The Lord would then allow those peasants to have a small portion of the produce from that land to live off of subsistence living. Crop rotation was practiced. One third of the land would lie fallow every year to allow the soil to recover. Now what fallow means is basically a third of the, of the land would be left empty on any given year. Uh, and then the next year something would be planted on it and another piece of third of the land would be lying fallow. Um, and this would allow for the soil to rejuvenate. This was needed to be done in order to not wear out the soil by planting the same thing over and over again each and every year. But that did mean that only two-thirds of the land were under production on any given year. So that of course reduced the amount that uh, any farm could produce by one-third. Now let's talk about some of the specific peoples that came in that infiltrated the, the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire, and ultimately created kingdoms to fill the power vacuum left by the fall of the Western Roman Empire. We're going to start with one of the most powerful of those groups, the Franks. The Franks were one of the tribal peoples that came in and infiltrated Western Rome, causing it to fall. Remember, there were many different Germanic groups that came in, the Huns pushing these different Germanic groups westward. Ultimately, the Franks will settle in the area that was known as Gaul during the Classical Age. Uh, it was the area that had been conquered by Rome back under Julius Caesar. Um, but now it will be known as the land of the Franks, France. From this point forward, we will talk about it as the Kingdom of France. So these people come in, these Franks come in, they are tribal, many different tribes, many different chiefs, but ultimately by around 500, Clovis becomes sort of the head chief over all of the Franks. He's quote, elected, now that's not our normal kind of election folks, but he is chosen by all of the uh, leading chiefs in the Frankish tribes to become king of the Franks. And he becomes the first of these Germanic rulers, ultimately to convert to Christianity. This will be important because it will eventually ally the Franks with the papacy, or of course the Pope. Um, now, this is important. Why did this happen? Well, if you think about it, the Roman Empire collapses, yes. But that does not mean all of the people that had been living in Gaul leave, okay, when the Franks come in. Of course, all those former Roman Gaulish citizens are now still living there, and uh, they are now being ruled by the Franks who have come in and taken over the area. They were Christian. Remember, Rome had converted to Christianity. Christianity had become the official uh, religion of Rome. Um, about a hundred or so years before this. So these Franks, as they come in and they are ruling over these former Romans, they adopt a lot of the Roman ways, including Christianity. That acted as a unifying force to uh, allow for those Franks to be able to rule over these former Roman citizens. Uh, and also that that unity also will be solidified when Clovis is baptized. Okay, the baptism of Clovis 
ultimately represents the uh, Franks accepting Christianity and of course he forces all of the Franks to convert to Christianity and this allows for those Roman citizens that he now rules over to accept Frankish rule. It was a unifying force. And the Latin language that was spoken there already will be intermixed ultimately with the Frankish language to form what is now known as French, the Latin based language of French. After Clovis converted to Christianity and um, forced the rest of the Franks to convert to Christianity, he used that Christianity kind of as a, an ex a means to an end, if you will. Uh, outsider Germanic or rival Germanic tribes that lived on the outskirts of France in areas like Bavaria, which is in central Germany now, as well as to the north in like modern day Belgium, were, who were not Christian, he used his Christianity as an excuse to attack them and take their land. Ultimately, Clovis will create the most powerful kingdom in Western Europe since the Roman Empire and he starts a new dynasty. This dynasty is known as the Merovingian dynasty and it will last several generations. After a couple hundred years under the Merovingian dynasty, the Franks were actually challenged by the Umayyad Muslims uh, who were pushing from the south they had taken over Spain, if you recall, from an earlier unit, the Umayyads had. So the Franks now led by another king, Charles Martel, also known as Charles the Hammer, uh, will have to go to war against the Umayyad Muslims pushing in from Spain, trying to push into southern France from Spain. This it happened in 732 and it is the Battle of Tours. Now the Battle of Tours ultimately will signify the halting of the Islamic spread um, and from this point forward uh, is sorry the halting of the Islamic spread further into Europe I should say. Uh, the Islamic spread will not spread any further northward into Europe and uh, but even though it will continue to spread in other parts of the world but this 732 Battle of Tours halting of the Islamic spread further north into Europe ultimately marks, you know, a, a, an important point in history for Europe. Europe will remain a Christian continent um, in opposition ultimately to the Islamic world to the south and to the east of them. Um, eventually, of course, this is going to lead to a showdown between Christian Europe, which is sometimes known as Christendom, and of course the Islamic world with the Crusades, which we'll talk more about later on in this unit. The Battle of Tours was a turning point, as I said. The Franks will prevent the Muslims from conquering any more territory in Europe although wars against the Muslims will continue, especially in the East with the Crusades. There's Charles the Hammer there, Charles Martel. After Charles, there will be Pepin, known as Pepin the Short, and ultimately he is known for saving Rome from, meaning the city of Rome, um, from being overrun by the Lombards. Pope Stephen II ultimately gave Pepin um, the crown as king of the Franks, basically recognizing a kind of alliance between the Franks and the papacy. And uh, this is when the Carolingian dynasty in France begins. Pepin's son, Charlemagne, is probably the most important of all of the Carolingian kings. Charlemagne will reestablish an empire approximating the size of the Western Roman Empire, briefly unifying Europe in the Dark Ages. The Frankish Empire under Charlemagne ultimately is almost a revival of the Western Roman Empire, but at this time under the Franks, 
However, it does not last beyond the life of Charlemagne. Ultimately, after Charlemagne's death, it will be divided up and um, become separate kingdoms. <clears throat> Here is Carlos Imperator Augustus. That basically is Charlemagne Imperator, meaning he is the emperor, of course, the August one, recognizing him as kind of a unifying force in Western Europe once again, 250 years or so after um, the fall of Rome. Actually, more like 350 years after the fall of Rome. In 800, recognize, the Pope recognized the power of Charlemagne having united most of Western Europe under his authority by crowning him Holy Roman Emperor. Now this was done in 800 on Christmas Day when Charlemagne came to the city of Rome where the papacy was located and was receiving mass that day. Um, the Pope surprised him by putting a crown on his head and claiming him Holy Roman Emperor, sort of uh, acknowledging the idea of a united Western Roman Empire under a Western King once again. Now Charlemagne had a little bit of a predicament here because he was willing to accept the title Holy Roman Emperor, showing that there was a, uh, a tie between his kingship an alliance, if you will, and the papacy, Holy Roman Emperor. But he was a little concerned that the Pope felt that he had the power to crown Charlemagne and give him that title. Did this mean that the Pope thought his authority was more important as the spiritual authority over all Christians than any secular power like Charlemagne's? And the, the answer is yes, of course he did. Uh, he saw his authority coming directly from God, and he was, you know, God's representative on earth, whereas Charlemagne was just a temporal or earthly ruler. This troubled Charlemagne a bit, and he wanted to make sure that his successors would receive the title Holy Roman Emperor from him, from the bloodline, rather than from the Pope. <clears throat> from this point forward, trying to send a message to the Pope that yes, we have an alliance, but no, you're not more powerful than me. This kind of tug of war between which power is more important, the secular power or earthly power of an earthly king, or the spiritual power of the papacy being the representatives of, you know, of Christianity on earth, um, will ultimately be a tug of war that the kings in Europe and the popes um, throughout this medieval period fight, uh, which is more important. And in some cases, they come to blows over it, and there will be wars between popes and kings over this in the future as we go through the medieval period. Charlemagne considered himself the strong right arm of God. And he defended Europe ultimately from future attacks from the Muslims from the south, as well as from a new group of individuals in the ninth century that started putting pressure on uh, Europe from the north. They were the Vikings and they were pagan as well. So again, Charlemagne used his Christianity as a unifying force, uh, a rallying cry, if you will, of the of the Frankish people that now controlled even more of Europe to defend Europe from these outsiders, the Muslims pushing from the south and the Vikings pushing from the north. Charlemagne aggressively and often brutally spread Christianity as he um, conquered these different peoples. Uh, and he opened a school eventually in Aachen, um, to educate priests. Now, Aachen would become a new capital for the Frankish Empire now. Clovis had established Paris, perhaps you've heard of it, as his capital earlier on back in the 500s. But now in the late 700s, early 800s, Charlemagne is moving westward, taking more western territory. So he has to create a more central capital for his empire at Aachen. And he wants to educate the priests, spreading Christianity, educating the priests, and making sure that ultimately those priests in his realm 
are following his orders. Another way he can kind of challenge the Pope's authority a little bit while still maintaining an alliance with Christianity. That tug of war continues. Alcuin was a monk during the Carolingian dynasty under the authority of Charlemagne that led efforts to preserve some of the Greco-Roman writings that had been almost virtually lost in the, you know, time from the fall of Rome to the 800s. This sort of sponsored a, a revival of learning throughout the Carolingian Empire, and it's known as the Carolingian Renaissance. It's not the big renaissance that we'll talk about, you know, as we move into the 1400s, however. This little revival will not last very long because after Charlemagne's death, when the Carolingian Empire is divided up um, among his grandsons, ultimately, this Carolingian renaissance will go by the wayside. And so most of the preservation of the Greco-Roman writings during this time period was done by those Islamic scholars in the Abbasid dynasty. Alcuin, however, did invent lowercase letters. Charlemagne united the empire through the Misi Dominici. Misi Dominici were his personal messengers and or spies uh, throughout the empire that would go out um, on a regular basis, a circuit, if you will, riding through all of his provinces, proclaiming his laws, and reporting back to him if um, the lords uh, and the vassals in the regions were not uh, towing the line like they should. Now, um, the Misi Dominici did kind of create unity, though, um, because it kept the people in line. You never knew when a Misi Dominici was going to visit your realm as, if you were a lord. So you needed to make sure that you were minding your P's and Q's. So under Charlemagne, there was a bit more of a centralized governing system rather than the traditional feudal system that had developed in the earlier medieval period. But like I said before, after Charlemagne's death, this uh, brief, you know, centralized governing system that we see under the Carolingian dynasty will actually go by the wayside, and feudalism will replace it once again, a more decentralized kind of governing structure. Charlemagne's laws were called Capitularies, capitularies, and they uh, he enforced military obligations of the lords to him, the Misi Dominici system, and the reform of the church. In 1843, at the Treaty of Verdun, Charlemagne's empire would be divided between his three sons and then his grandsons. Uh, his three sons fought each other as invaders ravaged Europe, and ultimately because they were fighting against each other, the uh, empire will be divided and the unity of Europe once again falls apart. And this will lead to once again the feudal system kind of taking hold, um, decentralized authority rather than a centralized governing structure being strong. Here's Charles the Bald. He will uh, have control over what is really modern day France. Here's Lothair, the central part of Charlemagne's previous empire, including Northern Italy, except for the Papal States that you see there in yellow. That's still controlled by the Pope. And then Louis the German, controlling the areas that is, you know, modern day Bavaria, German, Germany territory. Louis the German will maintain the um, title of Holy Roman Emperor as well. And there, of course, are the Pope's lands labeled. At the Treaty of Verdun, the western section of the empire became the Kingdom of France, the part that you see in red. And of course, the fleur de lis becomes the symbol associated with the Kingdom of France. In seven, sorry, in 
987, the last of the Carolingian rulers died uh, in France and was replaced by a new dynasty started by King Hugh Capet. This begins what is called the Capetian dynasty. Now the Capetian dynasty never really had a lot of centralized power and instead the king was kind of a figurehead and the majority of the power was in the hands of his nobles. The lords underneath him were the ones that were really in charge of protecting the realm from the outside invasions that had continued from the Vikings through this time. Um, ultimately, the Capetian dynasty is not a very strong dynasty and the French feudal system really takes hold with this kind of decentralized governing that we discussed earlier in this lecture. Now let's talk about the Kingdom of England. There's Ireland, there's Scotland, there's Wales, and there's England. England never endured a feudal period, but had a limited monarchy, where the monarch's power was shared or limited by the law. How in the world did this develop in this era? Well, I'll tell you. In 1066, William the Conqueror, who had been the Duke of Normandy in France, now, actually, just so you know, Normandy is located, you see, right there in the northern part of France. He had been a lord in France, but traditionally it is known that his ancestors came from um, Norway. They had been Vikings. They had attacked the French coastline during the time, you know, after the death of Charlemagne when his empire was divided up between his three sons and they had lost some territories to the Vikings because they were fighting against each other instead of being able to focus their concentration on fighting the Vikings. So the Normans settle in northern France so they have Viking descent, Viking blood and eventually the Duke of Normandy in 1066 was William, known as William the Conqueror. He decides he's going to cross the English Channel and attack the last of the Anglo-Saxon kings. The Angles and the Saxons were those Germanic tribes that had infiltrated Great Britain or Britain uh, or Britannia, I should call it, uh, at the end of the Roman Empire. So he defeats King Harold II at the Battle of Hastings uh, he, King Harold II was the last of the Anglo-Saxon kings and when William the Conqueror does this, defeating King Harold at the Battle of Hastings, he becomes the first official King of England in the modern monarchy. <clears throat> the Bayou Tapestry uh, basically records this event of the Norman invasion. William the Conqueror, 1066, taking over England, defeating the Anglo-Saxons. The Bayou Tapestry is 230 feet long and it provides the history of the Battle of Hastings. And you can go and see it today in the British Museum. There you see England's King Harold receiving a fatal arrow to the face, ending his reign and the looting that went on during the battle. So, William the Conqueror establishes a new dynasty. He builds his own palace. By the way, his palace is the White Tower of the Tower of London. And he establishes a dynasty that goes on for a couple hundred years. Eventually, however, one of his um, successors, uh, as we know with dynasties, sometimes you have strong kings, sometimes you have weak kings. Um, and by the time we get to his great, great grandson, I think, King John, uh, he is a weaker ruler and he is not able to really um, challenge the power of the nobles in England. So in 1215, King John is forced by the nobles of England to accept some limits to his power. King John signed the Magna Carta, which basically states that the king must follow 
common law and cannot tax the people without their consent. Ultimately, what this does, folks, is it creates a precedent in England, ultimately for the lords to have certain powers, certain prerogatives that the king cannot challenge. This will ultimately create the precedent for the creation of the British Parliament, at least the House of Lords part of it. So the Magna Carta is a turning point moment in British history, showing that there will be a limited monarchy in England. It will not be an absolute monarchy in England. And generations, generations, generations later, when some monarchs that are stronger try to push the envelope and become absolute monarchs, they will not be able to do so, ultimately because of Parliament, because Parliament exists largely because that window was left open with King John signing the Magna Carta, which basically states the king is not above the law. In the late 1200s, this representative body called Parliament is officially created, and Parliament shares power with the king, but also maintains the power of the purse, meaning that the king cannot raise taxes without the consent of Parliament. Now, of course, when Parliament is created in the late 1200s, this quote representative body is more like the Senate was in ancient Rome. It's represented by the, the wealthy noble families that had forced King John to sign the Magna Carta. And so they become um, a, a representative body, meaning they represent those wealthy um, noble families. And when one um, dies it, holding that position in Parliament, um, another person from that same family will fill that seat. It was a hereditary position. So really, it's more like an oligarchy. There's Parliament right there. And there's the king. You see here the British flag, the original English flag. Of course, it looks different now because we've added more to Great Britain, to the Empire of Great Britain. Parliament, though, you see at the top here, the British Parliament building, uh, now is bicameral, meaning it has two houses. Uh, initially, in the 1200s, when parliaments were created, it was more just like the, the upper house, the House of Lords, that hereditary body. But now, parliament has evolved through the years to include a House of Commons that is elected now by, you know, voting for everyone, every citizen. But uh, initially, the House of Commons was not elected by everyone. Uh, there were many different um, stipulations put on who had the um, ability to vote and through the years through the centuries it'll evolve to eventually include what we call universal suffrage meaning every citizen getting the vote that does not happen for quite some time however house of lords house of commons the English government was limited, ultimately, meaning the English king was limited by a constitution. These initially were unwritten laws, but laws nonetheless, making absolute power in the hands of a king nearly impossible because Parliament had certain prerogatives guaranteed to them through that Magna Carta, which was a written document. William the Conqueror's successors maintained their lands in France also. Yes, they were the kings of England, but they also were lords in France, especially Normandy, that traditional land that was his. Remember, he was the Duke of Normandy. And then eventually through um, inheritances and marriages, they gained control over more portions of French land. Ultimately, um, you would see, you will see that the English kings control almost half of the land in France at any given time. Um, and in 1337, they actually inherited the French throne um, through the bloodline, marriage alliances, etc. However, the last Capetian king, 
did not recognize um, the or the 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 Capetian when the Capetian dynasty comes to an end, I should say. Uh, the cousins, I guess you would say, of the Capetians did not recognize the right of the successors of William the Conqueror uh, to reign in France as well as in England. And so this will ultimately bring about a war between um, the French people who don't want William the Conqueror's heirs to be, you know, the kings of England and of France, and of course, those that do. This will lead to a massive war called the Hundred Years' War between France and England. King Edward III is the one who is trying to take the throne in France while controlling the throne already in England. He is the successor of William the Conqueror who attempts to do this. Ultimately, as I said, this is the beginning of what is known as the Hundred Years' War. And it sees England and France ultimately fighting for who's going to control the French throne. And if you look at the dates, 1337 to 1453, you'll note that it's longer than 100 years. This war goes on for longer than 100 years, although it's not constant fighting all the time. Ultimately, it would go back and forth between the two sides. The English were actually winning early on. They had better weapons. They had the longbow, which could penetrate the French armor. They had more men because they had raised foot soldier armies instead of the traditional knights and vassals. Uh, but ultimately, the French will turn the tide. And a lot of it has to do with this young lady, Joan of Arc. So, Despite the early English successes, the French ultimately will be able to win the Hundred Years' War. Joan of Arc proved a critical factor in the French victory. She was a French peasant girl who received visions from God telling her to go meet with the French king and tell him that the Lord commands that he give her control over some French armies. Now, of course, this would be a tough sell. First of all, she's a peasant. Second of all, she's a girl. Okay, and how in the world is she going to get an audience with the king? She kept having these visions. She kept having these messages. And eventually, word got to the king of France, who was being challenged by the kings of England for his throne. Uh, um, and he started thinking, gosh, if I don't listen to her, and she really is hearing messages from God, then I'm doomed. I'm never going to win this war. Uh, if I do listen to her and give her troops and she fails, uh, that shows that she was crazy and I don't really have anything to lose. So ultimately she was given command of troops at the Battle of Orléans or Orleans. She is victorious. She will go to win several other battles. She ultimately will be captured by the English and burned at the stake as a heretic. Um, they don't believe that she had visions from God. But ultimately, she becomes a symbol of French resiliency and French nationalism. And Joan will become kind of the symbol around which the French troops will rally. And they will eventually be victorious over the British. Now let's talk a little bit about the Vikings of Scandinavia. By the way, we'll talk more about the Hundred Years' War later on in this lecture. The Vikings of Scandinavia, those Scandinavian territories, which include, of course, Norway and Sweden and Denmark, Scandinavia is located right there. The Vikings, aka the Northmen or Norsemen, were a Germanic people from modern day Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. The Scandinavian soil in those villages was very rocky and growing this, the, the growing season was very short. Growing was difficult. Growing of agriculture was difficult on this kind of land. So with limited farming, the Vikings, as they were came to be known, in the Scandinavian territory uh, turned to exploration and raiding other lands to try to make a living. The Viking ships were remarkably well built, some of the best, will, the best built ships 
in the world at this point. They could hold up to 300 soldiers in a ship, and they were capable of handling rough oceans as well as shallow rivers. So if they got the wind behind them, they could navigate upriver into a state to raid it. Between the 700s and the 900s, the Vikings routinely invaded areas of Western Europe and Russia. They even conquered parts of France, England, and Ireland. If you look at the map here, you see all of the areas that they were able to penetrate going even upriver in these boats. Ultimately, they will raid all of these areas, wreaking havoc. And this is another reason why, ultimately, you will not see a lot of political unity in Western Europe. Um, at, especially after the fall of the Carolingian dynasty. And instead, you have localized governing where uh, the power is mostly in the hands of the lords who raise the armies of knights to try to protect their smaller territories of the whole realm. The feudal system largely continued into the 900s due to these constant raids going on by these outside invaders. So if you think about it, we have now seen two different waves of invasions in Western Europe that destabilized the governing structures there. The first one being, of course, with those Germanic tribes infiltrating the Western Roman Empire, putting pressure on it and causing it to fall to collapse in the 5th century in 476. Now after you start seeing the creation of these kingdoms under these um, Germanic peoples that when they settled in the former Roman Empire in the West um, and you do see a bit of unity especially with the Frankish Empire under the Carolingian dynasty under Charlemagne you see that fall apart once again and destabilize with this new wave of barbarian if you will incursions these Vikings putting pressure on um, Europe once again causing a causing a fracturing of authority and once again leading to decentralized governing instead of one strong centralized governing system in Europe so again, that's a theme. We've seen invasions and migrations and how they can sometimes destabilize rather than unify. Okay, so this is uh, another theme that we will talk about and would be a good thing for an essay question. You know, compare and contrast these different invasionary groups that destabilize the region in the 5th century with the fall of Rome, Western Rome, and in the you know, uh, I guess you would say the 9th, 10th century with the Vikings. They crossed the Atlantic ultimately also and established colonies in Iceland, Greenland, and even Newfoundland. The Vikings were really the first ones to land in um, the New World, although they're not given credit as often as the Portuguese and the Spanish. By around a thousand, the Viking Age ended as Europeans improved their defenses against them. And also, many of the Vikings started to convert to Christianity. And the climate throughout Europe also started a warming trend. This also allowed for more farming to happen in Scandinavia because the soil became better as a result of it not being frozen. Now let's talk a little bit more about life in Europe in the Middle Ages. We'll go into a little bit more detail about the uh, decentralized governing structures under the feudal system. But first, let's talk about the power of the Roman Catholic Church. If you will, the Roman Catholic Church was really the only unifying force throughout Europe at uh, during the Middle Ages, since they had lots of different governing structures rather than one centralized empire. They all shared in common that they were Christian. That was what survived from the Western, the fall of the Western Roman Empire. So the one source of unity throughout all of Europe during the Middle Ages was the power of the Roman Catholic Church under the authority of the papacy, which was controlled by the Pope. The Roman Catholic Church 
therefore became the most powerful institution in Western Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire. Between the 300s and 400s, Catholic missionaries traveled through Western Europe converting those Germanic and Celtic peoples all throughout what had been um, you know the western half of the Roman Empire as well as continuing in what is the eastern half of the Roman Empire that continues the Byzantine Empire that was discussed at the beginning of this unit. St. Patrick in Ireland is an example of one of those Catholic missionaries that will move into Ireland to convert the um, Anglo-Saxons that had settled in that region and the Celts that had settled in that region. The church's hierarchical organization, where the clergy were assigned to dioceses, gave structure to the politically fragmented Western Europe. Here is a breakdown of the church's hierarchical organization, starting at the bottom and going to the top. The laity are the regular Christians, regular worshipers, like you and me. They were baptized members of the Catholic Church. The deacon was an ordained minister who assists a priest. Then you have the priest who are ordained ministers and spiritual leaders in communities and congregations. Then you have a pastor, the priest in charge of an entire parish. Then you have a bishop who is the leader of a diocese collection of parish parishes. Then you have a cardinal above him which was to advise and help elect new popes when the time comes, and the Pope himself, the leader of the Catholic Church. Now sometimes the one that's called the pastor there will also be known as, um, you know, a, a supreme priest or something like that. And also sometimes with the bishop level, you'll see actually two levels, a regular bishop and then an archbishop over him. That was mostly in times where there were bigger cities that had more dioceses that had to be, um, you know, in, have leadership in. The clergy, of course, were the pope, the cardinals, the archbishops, the bishops, the priests, the monks. Uh, we'll talk more about monks later, uh, gained political power and wealth as well as religious power throughout the medieval period because they controlled salvation. Um, no one could get salvation except through the Roman Catholic authorities um, because this became the common belief, the common practice during this time. And this was largely because in the Dark Ages, very few people were able to read and write literacy declined in Western Europe and the ones that could read and write were the clergy. So ultimately the clergy were the ones controlling the message and they developed a, a system of sacraments, seven of them as a matter of fact, that people had to participate in in order to receive salvation. And it, and it became believed by many that if they, you know, uh, didn't do what the popes and the priests and the other clergy said, that ultimately those popes and priests and clergy could damn their souls to hell. Uh, that they had that kind of power over their souls, their salvation. They controlled salvation, if you will, through their control of the, of the church. Um, ultimately, this will be one of the reasons why much later in the 1500s there will be a division in Christianity, um, a breaking off from the Roman Catholic Church to the creation of the Protestant Reformation. That's much, much later down the road, however. Bishops, ultimately, were in charge of churches in urban areas, meaning city areas. And this happened more so as we move into the high Middle Ages, when we have a return of trade, a revival of trade, a revival of towns and cities. They were, they directed churches in these urban areas. <coughs> and the church also built monasteries for men and convents for women in rural areas. This is the creation of a new kind of clergy, uh, the monks and the nuns. They are sometimes known as regular clergy because they separate themselves from the secular world. 
whereas the other clergy that we already listed, the priests and the bishops, etc., etc., are known as the secular clergy because they interact with the secular world, with the population. Uh, these new kinds of clergy, this, this, this rise of what we sometimes call monasticism, is a, a new development in the, um, the Christian church that happens roughly in the 6th century AD. It really uh, becomes solidified with the creation of rules by which these communities of believers should live and abide by. In 540, the Benedictine rules were created by Saint Benedict, who was the head of one of these monasteries. Um, and it was created to regulate monastic life. It was based on three basic principles, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Monasteries provided stability in medieval Europe. Oftentimes, by removing themselves from society, oftentimes they would actually place these monasteries high up on a mountain or far away from the, um, the cities and um, the trade centers in order to get closer to God to remove themselves from the worldly um, realm, if you will. But these monasteries also provided stability and security. They protected refugees and treasures. They ran schools and libraries, and they hand copied books that could be preserved for later generations. Uh, many people would join monasteries to try to get to safety in an era where they were constantly being attacked while those Viking attacks were still going on. So oftentimes that would be the only way that a person could um, have safety. Sometimes it would be the only way that a person could get an education since the clergy were the, really the only ones that had any kind of education. The church also collected a tax over all Christians throughout all of Europe. This tax was called the tithe, and this is biblically based. Uh, the idea, and it came from Paul, from Paul's writings to his uh, Christian communities, the belief that they should give 10% of, of their annual earnings to the church. And the people believe that the church could also ensure salvation. Um, with them being given these tithes as well as um, the person maintaining the seven sacraments that were created by the Roman Catholic Church. European kings and nobility were often seen by the papal authorities as subordinate to the church, that the church represented a unifying force in medieval Europe that no king could challenge. Now, ultimately, this is going to lead to some more friction between those secular kings and the religious authorities over whose power is more important. As kings try to establish themselves and become more powerful, trying to bring an end to the feudal period and the rise of more centralized governments, uh, you're going to see them being challenged by these religious authorities um, over this issue. And this is going to continue to be an issue as we move through the medieval period. This tug of war, as I mentioned before, between secular authority and spiritual authority. <clears throat> pope Innocent III um, reigned as Pope between 1198 and 1216. And in it, he kind, in, in this writing here, he kind of puts into focus the importance that the papacy, the office of the Roman Catholic Church, saw uh, as of the clergy versus the power of the secular rulers. Of course, this emphasizes what the papacy saw as that spiritual authority having superiority over any secular authority. And Pope Innocent writes, as God set two great lights in heaven, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. So he set two great dignitaries, people, to rule the earth. The greater to rule the day, that is, souls, and the lesser to rule the night, that is, bodies. These dignitaries are the papal authority and the royal powers. <clears throat> 
and just as the moon gets her light from the sun and is inferior to the sun, so the royal power gets the splendor of its dignity from the papal authority. It's pretty clear that he sees papal authority as primary and supreme over any secular king's authority. Now let's talk a little bit about the Crusades. The European state expansion that started happening as we move into this period known as the High Middle Ages from about 1000 to 1500 AD uh, Eventually, will uh, you'll see the expansion of power of these kings, centralizing their authority in these in these European kingdoms. Of course, challenging the power of the Pope while they're doing it. Uh, tug of wars going on at home in Europe, but also you will see tug of wars going on between Christian Europeans and the Eastern world under um, Muslim rule. European state expansion the threat of the Muslims to the Byzantine Empire and Christian zeal, all three led to a series of wars called the Crusades. The Crusades were basically Christian holy wars that were seeking to reclaim the Holy Lands or Palestine and the city of Jerusalem from Muslim Turkish control. By this point, the Seljuk Turks had taken over the territory that had once belonged to the Abbasid dynasty, and before that had belonged to the Umayyad dynasty, and before that had belonged to the Byzantine Empire, which was, of course, the eastern half of the Roman Empire. So at this point, we see, if you look at the map here, that all of those territories, Jerusalem, etc., you see there are in the hands of the Muslims under the Seljuk Turks. And that is the, I guess you say, catalyst for the Crusades beginning. The First Crusade actually begins um, right after Pope Urban II called a meeting. In 1095, he called a meeting, the Council of Clermont, where he called for a crusade. He wanted Christians from all over Europe, Christian knights from all over Europe, to come and fight on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church, on behalf of Christianity, um, to try to retake the Holy Lands so Christian pilgrims could once again visit the site of Jesus' crucifixion. In Jerusalem. Christians were promised by the Pope remission of their sins if they went on this crusade and salvation if they salvation would have be immediate if they died while fighting the infidel. Interestingly enough the Christians refer to the Muslims as the infidel and the Muslims refer to the Christians as the infidel. Um, ultimately this promise of remission of sins was a big deal. You see, by this point, the Roman Catholic Church had developed seven sacraments that marked different points in a Christian's life. And the practice had become so much a part of the Christian doctrine by this point that it was believed, because the Roman Catholic Church insisted on this belief, that if a person did not participate in the seven sacraments, they could not receive salvation. This is what I meant when I said that the um, clergy became the most powerful um, force in medieval Europe. They controlled salvation. Now, one of the sacraments was known as the last rites. And it was thought that if you died before receiving the last rites from a priest, that your soul could not go to heaven right away because it still had the uh, residue, if you will, of the last sins that you committed since your previous, your last confession on your soul. And you had to, your soul had to go to a kind of waiting area called purgatory before it could enter heaven. Um, it had to spend a certain amount of time there depending on how heavy your sins were. So what 
Pope Urban II is doing with this call to crusade? Is he saying that if you die while fighting a crusade, your soul will be cleansed right away, even if you can't receive last rites because you died on the battlefield? Your soul will go right to heaven. It's called a plenary indulgence, and you will not have to go to pur your soul will not have to go to purgatory before entering heaven. Now, folks, this was again remember an invention of the Roman Catholic Church. This notion of purgatory, um, because there uh, that that will be something that will be a bone of contention later on as we enter the 1500s, and we have the Protestant Reformation. There doesn't seem to be anything biblically based on the idea of purgatory, okay? But again, the regular faithful people did not know this because the majority of people in Western Europe could not read or write. The ones that could read and write were the clergy, and the clergy were the ones interpreting the scripture to the believers. So this was what was different between Christian Europe and, and Western Europe and um, and other areas that, where there was more literacy. Pope Urban said, All who die by the way, whether by land or by sea, or in battle against the pagans, shall have immediate remission of sins. This I grant them through the power of God, with which I am invested. Pope Urban II. In 1096, after Pope Urban's call at the Council of Claremont for the First Crusade, it begins. 1096, the First Crusade exploited divisions among the Muslim factions in the region and ultimately used divide and conquer and were able to take, the Christian Crusaders were able to take control over Jerusalem. In 1187, however, a Muslim general named Saladin will unify the Muslims in that area in order to retake control over the Holy Lands, to take back Jerusalem. And they will be successful in doing so. So the Christian Crusaders will not have control over Jerusalem for very long, less than a century before it will be retaken by the um, now, I guess you would say, combined Muslim forces under Saladin. Um, that division that they had had that the Christian Crusaders were able to exploit in the First Crusade goes by the wayside in the Second Crusade when those Muslim forces unite under General Saladin. The next three Crusades all failed for the Christian Crusaders. They will not be able to get back Jerusalem. And these all fail by 1291. The Crusaders will not be able to retake the Holy Lands. And ultimately this means that the Crusades ultimately are a failure. If the object of the Crusades was to regain and maintain control over the Holy Lands, ultimately after the First Crusade, the rest of the Crusades fail to do that. The Crusades ultimately were a turning point in European history. They laid the foundation for tremendous positive changes even though the object of the Crusades to regain the Holy Lands was a failure. Now don't get me wrong, there's lots of terrible things that come out of the Crusades. Lots of hatred, lots of animosity, lots of death, lots of destruction. But ultimately there will be some positives, I guess you would say a silver lining that happened for European society. Because ultimately with the contact that the Christian Crusaders have with the East, with the Eastern world through the Crusades, we will have a reintroduction of learning and of culture that had been lost in Western Europe for the Dark Ages. You'll have a return of those ideas back into Western Europe through cultural diffusion due to increased contact between the West and the East with the Crusades. The Crusades brought Europeans into contact with the Byzantine Empire that they had lost a lot of contact with for many generations due to you know, the, the loss of cities and towns and trade, the stagnation of trade during the periods of, you know, constant invasion in Western Europe. 
It will also bring the Europeans into contact with Muslims who had also been sponsoring a golden age. So the Byzantine golden age, the Muslim golden age, all of that learning and culture will now start to be exchanged with the Western Crusaders as they come into contact with them, even though they're coming into contact with them through warfare. This will lead to great cultural exchanges that will ultimately benefit the West, reintroducing culture and education to the West. This renewed interest in learning, especially in Greco-Roman works that had been preserved, if you recall, by the Islamic world, will eventually lead to a renaissance in Western Europe. Even though we won't really talk so much about the Renaissance in this course this year, that will be saved for next year. It is something that is a byproduct of this, you know, um, high Middle Ages era. Also, renewed interest in trade in luxury items like silk and porcelain and spices will lead to more contact with the East and more peaking of interest to other ways to get to those spices. Eventually this will lead to the age of exploration that happens predominantly in the 1500s that you will also learn more about in a later course. Italian cities like Venice, Genoa, Florence, all prospered. And the Renaissance starts there. There's a direct correlation between that. Feudalism ultimately declines as kings grew more powerful by being able to tax towns and trade routes as they increase after the Crusades. This will eventually over time, by the time we get to the 1600s, this will lead to an age of absolute monarchs or absolute kings that, again, you will see in a later course. The Crusades also stressed the Muslim-Christian relations through the present day. Ultimately, a lot of the death and destruction between the two groups has led to resentment between the two groups that still persists to this day. Now let's talk a little bit more about the High Middle Ages. The High Middle Ages, remember, roughly 1,000 to 1,500. Even though we've been talking a little bit about that time period already, let's talk a little bit more about what society was like in the High Middle Ages. By around 1000, Europe was showing signs of revitalization, called the High Middle Ages. Innovations in agricultural techniques and technologies led to increased food production and therefore population growth. Remember what we say, more food, more people. Some of this was possible because the barbarian incursions, those Viking invasions, uh, started to taper off. As we said before, the climate started to warm and it led to uh, an increase in agricultural production. And they also developed different techniques and technologies, some of which came from the East, uh, like the iron plow that came from China along the trade routes, you know, the, the Silk Road, increased contact because of the Crusades allowed for that Silk Road trade to eventually reach some of that to reach Europe um, will lead to more innovations in agricultural production. All of this will benefit Western Europe in the long run. The open field system replaces the three field system. And the open field system and inventions like the mold board, which was a better iron plow, and the horse collar also helped farming. Now, the iron plow is necessary to break up the hard, rocky soil of northern Europe, especially that froze from time to time. So that would be beneficial for that, digging into the earth deeper to plant those seeds um, and to have better uh, crops as a result. You also see the horse collar developing, and this will help be helpful too. Instead of just depending upon oxen, as you see here, to pull your uh, plow, 
say you had a rocky hillside that you wanted to bring under production and to plant some um, crops on. You needed a more sure-footed animal to do that. And um, a horse was a lot more sure-footed than an oxen. But they needed a different kind of collar to put on the horse to pull the plow so it did not choke him. If they used the regular oxen collar, it would choke him. So they developed the horse collar that would allow for the weight of the plow to be put on the horse's shoulder area rather than on his neck so it would not choke him. Cities also started to revitalize during this era. Uh, cities became centers of trade, craftsmen, and specialized laborers. The return of a money-based economy rather than a barter economy as well. So again, things that we had had during the Roman Empire that had gone by the wayside a bit in the um, early Middle Ages and the Dark Ages, we saw some of it come back with Charlemagne, but then disappear again after his empire is divided. Once again, we have a revitalized trade, revitalized of ci sorry, a re return of cities, and a money-based economy rather than just a barter economy. Europe's revival in the High Middle Ages. The Hanseatic League was a, an economic league formed on, on the North and Baltic Sea regions. Member cities cooperated with each other to improve trade in Northern Europe, creating free trade zones so trade would move more freely between the cities that belong to the Hanseatic League. Ultimately, this will foster trade by limiting the amount of taxes charged you have uh, more willingness to do trade between those cities and that will of course lead to more cultural diffusion as well. Artisans organized themselves eventually into guilds. Guilds were associations of craftsmen within an industry that regulate product standards and prices. They did this to try to decrease the amount of competition so they could keep prices higher to benefit them, the producers, ultimately. Guilds dominated manufacturing in the High Middle Ages. Now when I say manufacturing, I'm not talking about the factory system yet. I'm talking about still hand manufacturing, but it's still manufacturing. Manufacture just means to make, okay? So guilds dominated making things in the High Middle Ages. Again, eliminating competition between members allowed prices to rise, which would benefit those guilds members, all of them. Um, it may not benefit the consumers, but it did benefit the rising middle class. Those artisans, those guildsmen are the rise of the middle class once again in high, the high middle ages. Ba the banking industry also grows in Europe as a result of this. Now, usury was an issue, however. Usury uh, is a, uh, the charging of interest for the use of money. Um, and ultimately, that was seen by the church as a bad thing, okay, as a committing heresy against the doctrine of the church, which, of course, is a big no-no. Um, but many merchants found ways around the usury laws that had been put in place in the um, early Middle Ages, the Dark Ages period. And ultimately, this will lead to the development of more modern day capitalism, where businessmen can take out loans from banks to build their businesses and ultimately you know, reinvest in their business to build their businesses to make more money, pay off their loans and expand their businesses. Serfs uh, who migrated from the regular manor farms into cities and towns uh, to help do business, they lived there oftentimes for a year and a day. And if they could do that and find a way to make a living and pay you know, fees to their lords back on the manor, they could earn their freedom. They could basically purchase their freedom away from those feudal manors. This led to the rise of towns and trade as well. This also helped to foster an intellectual movement called scholasticism, especially as we move into the 12th and 13th centuries.
Scholasticism can sometimes be seen as a proto-Renaissance. The Renaissance itself does not really happen until the 1400s, but this earlier period kind of kick-starting this idea, proto-Renaissance, if you will, scholast the scholastic movement of the 12th, 12th and 13th centuries. Now, scholasticism ultimately attempted to reconcile the beliefs and values of Christianity, meaning faith, with Greek philosophy, which was now being reintroduced to Western Europe due to increased contact with the East that had preserved these um, writings. And remember that increased contact was because of the Crusades, so this was one of the byproducts of the Crusades for the West. This faith versus reason thing what's more important, faith or reason, started to be grappled with by certain individuals during this time period. Peter Abelard was one of them, Albertus Magnus, and of course Thomas Aquinas. Most all of these are of course clergy figures, and ultimately they're going to stress the importance of your faith being dominant. But many of them started to recognize that one could actually buttress, meaning support, their faith through experiments with reason and learning about philosophy uh, from these Greek people that were pre, you know, pre-Christian peoples, that the two things, faith and reason, don't necessarily have to be completely separate of each other. This also led to a, um, I guess you would say, a, a birth of um, using more and more of the vernacular languages in writings, in new scholarship that was being produced. Now the word vernacular is basically a generic term that means the everyday language of a people. And so vernacular is what the people spoke. As more and more um, writing is being done, uh, more education, more intellectual activity, instead of writing in just Latin, which had been the language of the Roman Empire, if you remember, as well as the language of the Roman Catholic Church, okay, it was seen for centuries that the only real writing, the real intellectual writing had to be done in Latin. Now we see more and more uh, intellectual fervor being written in vernacular languages. And this replaced a lot of the Latin in literary works. This will give rise to the notion of, you know, uh, I guess national languages. The oldest known vernacular book was actually written in the vernacular Danish around 1250. language of books printed in Europe, by the time we get to the 1500s, you see Latin is still dominant, 70%. But you start seeing more and more um, German, Italian, French, Spanish, Dutch, English, um, etc. being produced as you move into the 1500s. So even though we're talking now in the high Middle Ages, we're still a few hundred years away from this in the 1500s, it ultimately is connected. This, this scholastic movement will eventually give rise to the Renaissance, which gives rise to even more vernacular texts being created. And more learning and literacy as a result as well. A perfect example of this is looking at Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy and Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Now, the Divine Comedy was written in the Italian vernacular. It actually was the um, Florentine dialect of Italian that it was written in because Dante was from Florence. And Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales was written in the English vernacular. Uh, both of these um, give us insights into medieval life, what was going on in Italy and England at the time through looking at the, you know, the action and the stories, but they also both fostered the creation of a national language of Italian in Italy and a national language of English in England. We also see the return of monumental architecture during the High Middle Ages. Remember, that had virtually been 
uh, abandoned during the Dark Ages. So monumental architecture returned with a new style of architecture called Gothic. The Gothic style is um, um, probably the most famous cathedral that was built in the Gothic style is Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Um, of course, now it's it's damaged. Um, a fire happened a couple of years ago, a few years ago, um, that made the roof collapse. Um, but fortunately, the majority of it, the exterior was salvaged. The belfry, bell towers were saved, um, and they are currently um, renovating it to try to bring it back to its old glory. Medieval society was largely patriarchal. But women managed households, and peasant women worked outside the home as well. Now let's talk about the crises, multiple crises, if you will, crises, in the late Middle Ages that will bring everything, tear everything down, pull it apart. Ultimately, even though we have just started rebuilding Europe, there will be a number of crises that hit that kind of tear apart medieval society. But this tearing apart of medieval society actually will do some good in the long run. It will lead to the rise of really strong centralized monarchies in Europe once again, okay, in separate kingdoms rather than one united all of Europe in one empire. It's breaking the back of the feudal system though ultimately with these strong kingdoms being created. Peace will eventually be restored after a long period of warfare during the late Middle Ages. Um, but and ultimately these, these terrible tragedies that happened in the late Middle Ages, primarily in the 1300s, will allow for a rebuilding of Europe to happen even on a grander scale than we had seen it starting to happen in the High Middle Ages. This rebuilding will be in the Renaissance period in the 1500s. So we have to tear it down before we can build it back up. The Black Death, 1347, is where we will start. First of all, let's discuss the causes. The bubonic plague was carried by fleas on Asian black rats and brought to Europe on ships returning from Asia. Overcrowding in cities and homes facilitated the spread of the disease. Poor sanitation in cities, Garbage-filled streets, human excrement, and dead animals also contributed. Widespread malnutrition prior to the plague, largely due to the famine that occurred in 1315, led to poor health. For example, lower immune systems. And that made people more susceptible to the disease when it hit. Poor hygiene also played a significant role. Upwards of one-third of the population of Europe died as a result of the bubonic plague. Here's a map of the Black Death. The economy and towns suffered significantly due to the plague. While in the countryside, there were less affected by the plague, but they were not not affected at all. There were still effects of the plague in the countryside. It was just less severe than it was in cities because people did not live in as close proximity to each other in the countryside that they did in the cities. This image here shows you that plague doctors often wore attire, um, such as seen above here, with the beak stuffed with spices or herbs that they thought would protect the doctor from the disease. It, of course, did not protect the doctors from the disease. In some areas, workers enjoyed higher wages as the supply of workers was depleted due to all of the deaths. Silver lining, I guess. The impact on the peasantry, however, was great. Serfdom will end in many areas of Western Europe due to the uh, massive amount of deaths. Major peasant revolts occurred all over, but especially in England and France. The first enclosure of fields in Britain occurred as landowners needed better agricultural production with fewer farmhands. So they enclosed the common pasture lands that had been available to all 
uh, for the pasteurizing of their animals during the Middle Ages. This was largely done for sheep herding and to increase sheep herding as um, a commercial venture. The be best of the clergy also died as they were the ones that stayed behind to help the sick and became infected as a result. Jews were often blamed for the plague and thus persecuted as the quote outsiders living among the Christian majority end quote they were targets. This continued the age-old phenomenon of anti-semitism in Europe that began with the Roman Empire but will continue through the 20th century and some would argue even today. Another crisis is the Hundred Years War between 1337 and 1453. The cause of this war ultimately it was over the British held territories in France. Great Britain controlled a huge chunk of French territory and they had since William the Conqueror of Normandy had conquered England and um, created the modern monarchy in England. By this point, by 1337, the English crown also laid claim to the Duchy of Aquitaine in France due to the marriage of Henry II to Eleanor of Aquitaine. After some initial victories of the British in the first 50 years or so of the war, the tide started to turn in the French favor with the emergence of Joan of Arc on the scene. 1412 to 1431. She was a French peasant girl who claimed she heard voices from saints and she persuaded the king that God wanted her to lead some troops to victory. She persuaded the king to allow her to accompany those troops ultimately in battle. In 1429 she led the French army to a victory at the Battle of Orléans and this was during a crucial stage of the war. This ultimately allowed for the French heir to the throne that was being challenged by the British king. His name was, uh, the French heir to the throne was Charles VII. He was ultimately crowned as a result of this victory. Ultimately, however, for Joan, it didn't end up so well. She would later be captured by the British forces and burned at the stake as a heretic for claiming that she heard the voice of God. This will turn the tide in the French favor. Here's a time lapse of the map of the Hundred Years War. You see the changing of the hands, which nation has control of which territories. And there's the end of France. The result of the Hundred Years War ultimately means that France will permanently remove England from all of those French territories that they had controlled except for the one place known as Calais. Calais will remain in English hands. It also resulted in the modernization of state building. This will begin in both England and France leaving feudalism behind and ultimately creating stronger centralized monarchies in both nations, challenging the power of those nobles and the power that they had had under the feudal system. Ultimately, you could say that the Hundred Years War helped to bring about the end of the feudal system. Now, another crisis is the crisis in the Catholic Church. The background. Western and Central Europe was dominated by the Catholic Church since the fall of the Roman Empire. That was the one sense of unity that all of Western and Central Europe had. Religious authorities in many regions were more powerful than the secular authorities, even more powerful than the kings. Popes at times were the most powerful political figure, figures in all of Europe. The Middle Ages, however, were characterized by this religious unity under the Catholic Church, but the Catholic authorities had many, many abuses. Ultimately, these abuses led to some folks 
becoming dissenters. A couple of examples are John Wycliffe from England and John Huss from Bohemia. John Wycliffe believed the church should only follow scripture. You could not trust the religious authorities, the actual men in power positions. So therefore, you had to depend upon the scripture for your guidance. This view actually foreshadows Martin Luther's Reformation in the early 16th century. John Wycliffe, as an Englishman, translated the Bible into the vernacular English. And his later followers will be known as Lollards. We'll talk more about them as we move into the Protestant Reformation. Here's Wycliffe giving, quote, the poor priests, his translation of the Bible. Now, John Huss, like I mentioned before, was from Bohemia. His ideas were similar to Wycliffe. Bohemia was in Central Europe. He led a nationalist movement there in Bohemia, which is the modern day Czech Republic. Ultimately, however, John Huss will be silenced by the Roman Catholic Church. He will be captured and burned at the stake for his heretical views. The Hussites were his followers, and they staged large rebellions in the 14th century throughout Central Europe. John Wycliffe and John Huss are oftentimes referred to as proto-reformers. The Reformation did not begin in the 14th century with them. It will not begin really until the early 16th century. Largely, this is because they did not have the benefit of the printing press to help spread their ideas. And Martin Luther did. The printing press will be um, invented roughly 1450, and that changes everything. We'll talk more about that when we get to the Protestant Reformation. The Babylonian captivity is another crisis in the Roman Catholic Church that happened between 1309 and 1377. Ultimately, it began in 1305 when a struggle between the current pope and the French king led to the election of a French pope who will leave Rome to set up his papacy in Avignon, France. This will lead to seven successive popes residing in Avignon and being elected by French cardinals. These seven popes were seen as puppets to the French monarchy, and therefore the power of the papacy seemed to be diminished, and the reputation of the papacy outside of France was seen as lessened. This situation damaged papal prestige. Rome's economy also was damaged significantly with the papacy not residing there. This ultimately will lead to the Great Schism starting in 1377. This happens when two popes were actually elected, one in Rome, Italy, and one in Avignon, France in 1377. Neither of them recognized the other as a matter of fact, each excommunicated the other. So no one in Europe knew who the real Pope was. It will eventually lead to an election of a third Pope and none of them stepped down. So it was a mess. This further damaged the prestige of the church and it will not be resolved until 1417. Another problem in the midst of the Great Schism was the conciliar movement. It was attempting to end the Great Schism by ultimately ref trying to reform the church by creating a council of cardinals that would be more powerful than the Pope himself. It failed, however, as a movement. The newly elected Pope Martin V in 1418 ensured that papal power still remained supreme. The fall of the Byzantine Empire is another crisis in the late Middle Ages. The Byzantine Empire had been the dominant power in southeastern Europe for a thousand years. It began as the Eastern Roman Empire, and the Greek Orthodox Church was dominant there. In 1453, 
a key turning point happened when the Ottoman Empire took control over Constantinople, the capital city of the Byzantine Empire, and its last major stronghold. The fall, ultimately, of the Byzantine Empire was the result, and now there was no buffer zone to protect Western Europe from the Islamic forces. Now that the Byzantine Empire fell, however, a byproduct of that would be that many Greek scholars who had specialized in the old ancient Greek texts will now flee Byzantium as it's falling and move into Western Europe. They travel along the trade routes through the Mediterranean and land in Italy. They were escaping Turkish rule, but they were bringing their scholarship, the ancient Greek scholarship that had been lost to Western Europe for centuries, would now be reintroduced to Western Europe as a result. This is one reason the Renaissance begins in Italy and then spreads northward through the rest of Europe. So a byproduct of the Ottoman Empire taking over the Byzantine Empire and the Byzantine Empire falling is the beginning of the rebuilding of Western Europe through the Renaissance after all of the crises of the late Middle Ages took it their toll. Ultimately, we'll talk more about that as we move into our Renaissance lectures. Constantinople, that capital city, would be renamed Istanbul and it remains Istanbul today is the capital of modern-day Turkey. Thank you.